is recording or share screen. But this one, share. Okay, then you have it. It should be there. Um, right there. Great job. Is that okay? Is it okay? Or maybe how is the whole screen? After that? Okay. <laughs> well, this is my computer. Okay, okay. so today in our uh, ICDB mathematical seminar, we have like a, a talk that is uh, between you know, an analysis and number theory. So, if you like one of these two areas, it's uh, probably it would be enjoyable. Uh, and the speaker today is Emily Quesada Herrera. He's a postdoc in the uh, Technical University of Graz there in, in Austria. And she was a former student of Emmanuel, so we know her very well. So, sorry. So, let's get here with the dog. Thank you, Christian, for the introduction. I want to thank Emmanuel and thank you for receiving me here again. Very happy to be here in the So, I want today to introduce some of the topics that I have worked for that. But here's the PhD and also in the class. So it's the thing that's Christian said, I'm gonna talk about some topics in the interface of analytic number theory and harmonic analysis, such as Fourier um, analysis, integers represented by quadratic forms, and the theory of the Riemann set of functions. So to begin, I want to introduce some of the protagonists of today's story. So first. This is the Fourier transform. So when a function f is nice, we can define that in this way. And this is very useful to study lots of oscillatory phenomena. Say, and this comes up, this comes up all the time in theory and applied mathematics. For example, in when you have electronic signals, like to make a call from a from a cell phone, you want to transmit the signal of this phone call, and you want to recover it in a precise way. So you want to transmit only certain frequencies. So here, if you have a function f, you define the Fourier transform as the integral with the function f, and this factor e to the minus two pi i x. See, so this is a complex exponential, so it is oscillating in the unit circle, and that's where we have the oscillations. Of course, we can write uh, we can write an exponential as in terms of sine and cosine. So again, we can see the alternations here. And one big question in the field is that of Fourier uncertainty. So the question is, up to what point can we impose some conditions on a function and on the Fourier transform simultaneously? And we want to recover a function and see what's the best possible way to do this. So again, for example, if you have some electronic signal, you have some restrictions in the frequency, and you want to recover the signal as efficiently as possible. And in theory of mathematics, you can study this problem directly, and there are many different ways to formalize this idea, like we did it or work with Emmanuel. But it also appears in many Fourier optimization problems that are connected to lots of different areas, like number theory or Yevonsin geometry. So this Fourier transform is going to be our first protagonist today. But now I want to talk about the Riemann set of functions. So when you have, say, f greater than one, or if we think of f as a complex number, real part of f greater than one, we can define the Riemann set of function as this sum. And it's going to convert to an analytic function. But also, we have sum over integers. And we, if we factor the integers by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, we can write this in terms of this product over prime numbers. So in a sense, we can think of this as the starting point of analytic number theory because we have a relation between prime numbers on one hand and an analytic function on the other. So by manipulating this identity we can, and looking at the analytic properties of this function, we can recover a lot of information in prime numbers. And using a little bit of complex analysis, we can show that we can actually extend it to a function so the analytic function in the complex plane is just a simple four, a simple to one, and it satisfies this functional equation. So this gives a relation between the value of s 
and the value at one minus x. And in which step, this is the complex plane, in which step to the right of this line will real part of x is greater than one. So the first formula holds. And here we know we can write the function as a product over prime. So a product of things that are not zero. So this is not going to be zero here. There are not going to be any zeros in this part. And because of the symmetry, so the sign here has some zeros. So this means that the rhythm theta function is going to have some zeros here at minus two, minus four, minus six, at all of the negative seven integers. And those are what we call the trivial zeros. But there cannot be any other zeros here to the left because of this functional equation and the other part and a little bit of work. So that means that all of the other zeros must lie here in this part between zero and one. And we call this the critical strip. And we can prove this today. But the Riemann hypothesis says that all zeros should actually lie here in the middle in this line. And we call it the critical line. It's the line real part of S equals to one half. But this is an extremely hard problem for many years. And similarly, we can define other related functions. So, like I said, the Riemann theta function is useful to study prime, but sometimes we are interested in studying prime to some special structures. So, for example, for prime in arithmetic progression, it is useful to study that there's the digit L functions. And still, they are defined initially in a similar way. But now we have in the numerator this function chi of n. And those are the least of characters, and we can think of them as completely multiplicative to periodic functions over C. So this has two nice properties. Since it is Q periodic, in a sense, it captures the structure of arithmetic progression, but also it is multiplicative, so we still can write it as a product over prime numbers. So now we can use this to study prime with this special structure. And there's also another one that I like. These are called the Hecke L functions. And we can think of this as a generalization of this L function to an algebraic number field. This is like if you take the ratio of numbers and you add, for, for example, P of i, which is the number that form written like VI with A and B right now. So this is a quadratic number field, and for some for some of the right number field like this, we can find this hecke L function in a similar way. So now instead of a sum over integers, we have a sum over integral ideals. And in the denominator, we have the norm of this ideal, which is an integer. And in the numerator, we have this special hecke character. And we can think of them as a completely multiplicative function over integral ideals, multiple some integral ideals. And in the same way that these L functions are useful to study present arithmetic progressions, this hecke L function can help us study a uh, prime ideal of the special structure. And as we will see, this also helps to study primes represented by quadratic points. But now let's go back to the case of the Riemann theta function. And let's see what we can say about the series. So first, we want to count how many zeros there are up to a certain height. So let's go back to this graph. We want to count the zeros inside this region in the critical strip from zero to a certain height t. So this, the number of zeros inside this region, is what we call n of t. And using a little bit of complex analysis, uh, the Riemann von Mantel formula gives us a very precise way to estimate this number of zeros. We first have a continuous part, and we have this special function f of t and a very good character. So we are counting something discrete, the zeros of the function, so it's going to have a lot of the continuity. But the first part is continuous, so this means that all of the interesting parts of the continuous are going to happen in the function s of t. So if we really want to understand the distribution of the zero, we want to understand the function s. This function s is defined in this way. It is the argument of the Riemann theta function in the critical line. It can be defined in terms of the logarithmic derivative, for example. 
and satisfy some bounds if it's smaller than the P and it's integral total small. So this means that it has a lot of oscillation and cancellation. So that means that if we want to understand the distribution of the theorem, we really need to understand the oscillatory and statistical information of this function S. So this is our goal. So um, to obtain some statistical and oscillatory information on the function f of t. For example, because of this formula here, because of the riemann mando formula, we can expect that there should be around delta zero in this short interval from t to t plus 2 by delta over log t. So we want to study this with more precision. This is what we call the number variance. This is the variance in the statistic sense of the number of zeros in this interval. So this is the mean square of the number of zeros minus the expected value. And because of this formula, we can write it in terms of f of t. So again, to understand the zeros, we need to understand s. Yes. So, okay, why are we interested in studying the zeros of the theta function? So it turns out that the distribution of the zeros is very closely connected to the distribution of primes, like it were left in the beginning, and this can be seen by using, for example, the so-called explicit formula. And these are equalities that connect expressions involving zeros with expressions involving primes. So if we understand the zeros, we can understand primes. And for some questions, like to understand by the the number of zeros, the number of primes of the rest. The real hypothesis gives us the best possible information that we can hope for. Like this is final system. So for some questions, the real hypothesis gives us the best possible information that we want. And uh, but for other questions, like if we want to understand primes in short intervals, we need to go beyond the Riemann hypothesis. So we are going to understand the finite vertical distribution of the theorem. So for example, well, if we assume the Riemann hypothesis and all of the theorems have this form, one half the psi gamma, and we want to understand the distribution of this coordinate gamma. To do this, well. By the formula, the Riemann-Mato formula, we can see that the average capital zeros must be to pi over log t, just by applying this first formula here. So we want to go beyond it. So Montgomery tries to understand what's the distribution of the gap between zeros. If we choose one zero, we want to count an average how many zeros we can expect at a certain distance. This is what Montgomery wanted to do. Or equivalently for a nice test function R, we want to study sums of this type. And Montgomery formulated his conjecture for the behavior of this. So let's see what this means. Here on the left, we have the sum over pairs of zeros such that the difference is at most some quantity beta times the average gap. So if the zeros were distributed like random points, this is what we call a, a Poissonian pre-correlation. If they were distributed like random points, we would expect for random points that the sum of all pairs of points. Should be beta times the number of zeros. So this is not the case. They are not distributed like uniform random points. We have this factor sine of phi u over qi squared giving us the distribution, giving us the this formula. So this is to be in a different way. And this is what Montgomery said. And furthermore, Montgomery noticed that this is the same function one of the if you study that the gaps between the eigenvalues of some. Random matrices. So Montgomery further conjectured that the ordinates of the non trivial zeros are distributed like the eigenvalues of a random matrix from a certain probability distribution called the Gaussian unitary ensemble. 
And this is a very nice conjecture because it fits very nicely with another conjecture of Herbert and Pauli, which says that the ordinates of materials must be the eigenvalues of a certain Hermitian operator. And if this were true, this would imply the Riemann hypothesis. So this is a very nice conjecture that goes beyond the Riemann hypothesis. Excuse me. What is it? Uh, like zero, but a pair of is uh, beta plus pi gamma. So I mean, this uh, imaginary part. The old fashioned term for the imaginary part of the company. Can you say the two coordinates? What do you use? French language. Yeah. Uh, no, no. <laughs> so we mean that the, the gamma are distributed in this way. <laughs> Uh, so again, Montgomery's goal was to understand for large D expressions like this. And if we want to build it, then we can apply a little bit of Fourier analysis. So we are going to introduce here a way just to make the problem simpler analytically, and we are going to normalize this by log T over two pi again for to simplify the analysis. And so to understanding this sum here is very similar to understanding the sum in the top. We just have a weight in a normalization. And if we apply Fourier inversion, then this sum can be written in this way in the right. And here we have this special function f. This was Montgomery's function f. We can define it in this way. So we can think of it as a weighted and normalized Fourier transform of the distribution function of the pairs of things. So because of this formula here, which is just for your inversion, if we want to understand this function in the top or this function here in the second slide, we need to understand the right hand side. Here we have the integral of f with the Fourier transform of r. So to understand this, we need to understand the behavior of this function f. And this is entirely as t goes to infinity. Well, the problem of estimating the sum was to do the problem of understanding this, and that's what Montgomery and then Gosson and Montgomery did. They showed that historically, when t goes to infinity, and when alpha is small between 0 and 1, we have a very precise formula for it. So, in other words, when alpha is small, we can understand this expression. But we want to know what's the behavior for all alpha. And Montgomery made a conjecture. That when alpha is greater than one, f is just a symbolic only one. But this is, looks like a very hard conjecture and it has been connected to very hard problems in number theory, like the behavior of Frank and short interval or the behavior of simple series derivative assumption. So it's still very far outside what we can do. And in particular, if this is true, then just by choosing special functions R, we can obtain the other version of the pair correlation conjecture. So this is why this formula is called a strong pair correlation conjecture. So now let's return to the function S of T. So as I said, to, to understand the distribution of the theorem, we want to understand the behavior of S. To, for example, study the statistical the statistical behavior of S of T. And you can use the method of moments and probability. If you want to understand the probability distribution, you can start by studying its moments. So start with this, this and start obtain all by the moments, assuming the hypothesis and this can also be obtained unconditionally with a weaker error term. So there we compute all of the even moments. And as a consequence, if we know all the moments, we know the probability distribution. This constant in the moments behaves like the moments of a Gaussian. So this means that we have a central limit theory. This, this means that S of T behaves like a Gaussian, it's distributed like a Gaussian with mean zero and with variance square root of one half level of t. So we have a very complete statistical information for this function f, which is what we wanted. And similarly, so I think that s of t is the imaginary part of the logarithm 
of the Riemann theta function in the critical length. So we can also study the real part. And it turns out that physically it has the same behavior. And so this two behave like independent gauges with this mean and variable. So the same statement holds for, for log mass theta in the critical line. They are both normally distributed with mean zero and this variance. And here are some pictures. Here on the left, we have the some numerical data of the distribution of the real part of the logarithm and the imaginary part of the logarithm. So this is f of p and this is plus of theta. And we can see that they both look very close to Lagosian, but it's interesting that this one looks much closer to Lagosian than this one. This one is like a little bit skewed. And so far, far as I know, there has not been any explanation for this unit because we know that in the link, they both should converge, but this one is converging slowly. This graph was taken from this paper of getting on SNAP, but the data was computed by at least me. So we might want to try to understand why there is this divergence in the two cases of the of the real part of the logarithm and the imaginary part of the logarithm. So for example, we can try to compute the variance with more precision. And it was done by Goldson in 1988. Assuming the right hypothesis, he estimated the second moment, but after the second order term. So the first order term is the one from here to cover. Now we also have the second one. And for the second one, this is very interesting because this is this constant A of T, and this constant contains information from prime numbers and also contains information from the theorems. So for the, the information in the theorems, it's classified in this function S. This is one government function for vector correlation that I mentioned before. So this has information on the theorems. And we can try to do the same for the real part of the logarithm to see if there is any difference. And we did this recently, but it turns out that the answer is the same. So for me, this is surprising because the proofs are actually a little bit different, and it is not obvious that they should give the same answer from the start, but at the end, it's somehow the same thing. So, this still doesn't explain the difference in the plot that we just saw. So, we want to go farther to try to understand the difference, and this is work in progress that we're doing right now. We want to understand this is QNET in the, in the graphs. So, the QNET of a probability distribution can be captured by the third moment. So we want to understand the third moment of f of t, and it turns out that here we do expect a difference. So for f of t, this third moment should be very, very small, and this makes sense because this is what we expect for a Gaussian. For a Gaussian, the third moment is just zero. But for the real part of the logarithm, it is not that small. We expect a term of size, a constant times t. So this will explain in some way the difference in the numerical plus. And in particular, this that I have here is a special case of a more general conjecture of getting and state that they obtained using this model of random matrices. And it's again interesting because we expect to see different results, but this is also much harder because like we needed information from the pair correlation of the zero for Gopson, like I just showed you, but here we just need some information from triple correlation and so far. It is not clear how to proceed, but this is something that we are working on right now. So I'm going to quickly talk a little bit more about the number variance of the theorems. So I need to just this quantity earlier. We want to obtain this is the confirmation of the theorems that the, the variance of the number of theorems in a certain short interval, and we can write this in terms of f of t up to a very small error. This is the number bar. So this has been studied by many authors, such as Barry, Keating, Fuji, Gallagher, and Miller. And Barry made a very precise conjecture about the behavior of this quantity. 
So first, as we said, there is the Hilbert Holger injection that says that the zeros, the alternate of the zeros should be the eigenvalues of some Hermitian operator. And later, Montgomery conjectured that they should actually behave like weighting values of some random matrix. It turns out that this conjecture of Montgomery, according to some numerical evidence, it is very good for some short rent statistics. This is the statistics between zeros that are very close together, but it fails for long rent statistics. This is the statistics between zeros that are very far apart. So we want to understand the correlations between zeros that are very far from each other. This random matrix does not work, and instead we need some extra information from prime numbers. This is what we used to know. So that later in 1988, Berry introduced a new model for the zero, and he uses he models the zeros as the eigenvalues of a certain Hamiltonian operator from quantum mechanics. So this is an operator coming from the dynamical sense of quantum mechanics. And with this model, it actually fits all of the numerical data, both in short ranges and long ranges. The short ranges is the model for the universal regime, and the long ranges are called the non universal regime. And it so far works perfectly well with all of the numerical data. So, that very used this new model for the zeros. To conjecture a very precise behavior for the number variables. I just included in this notation SI is the standard prime integral and CI is the standard cosine integral. So, this is what very conjecture. This is a lot formula. The important part is that okay, we have two parts. So, we have some shape, little delta. This little delta is the size of the interval that we're trying to find. No. So if the interval is very small, this is the first part A, little of not C. So if the interval is small, P conjectures some behavior. And this, what is interesting about this is that this behavior here in part A is exactly what we will obtain from random matrices. And that's the important part. So for part B, when the interval is larger, we have a very different behavior. So then the matrix should no longer work in this range. Instead, we need to use prime numbers. Prime numbers are captured in this function lambda of n. This is the lambda function. It contains, we can think of this as uh, I guess define prime numbers. This is the prime This is log t here. And it's a power of prime and zero order. So it's just a way of counting. Okay. Identifying prime numbers, and we need this prime number for the second part. So this really has a very different behavior depending on the range, and that's the interesting part of the And there have been several approaches so far. So, for example, Fuji, assuming very good hypothesis, let's now make a normalization of all the shift big delta. So, with the shift is so small. So this will correspond to part A here when the shift is small. Then he's able to compute this to obtain an asymptotic formula for this. And again, for this second term here, we get information from the theorems in, of, in the pair correlation, the function for pair correlation introduced by Montgomery Cats. And in particular, for this formula, if we also assume Montgomery's strong pair correlation conjecture, so if S is just asymptotically one, then this implies there is conjecture in part A, in the part where the rank is small. But however, we really expect a different behavior in the second part. So we need to use, we really need to use other tools to be able to tackle that second part. So for that, we we use we introduce this function. This is a function introduced by Chan in 2004. It is defined in this way. It is very similar to Montgomery's function, but we now have some parameter big delta here, and it appears here. So instead of counting that correlation, the pairs of zeros is different. It's very small. 
we want the differences in a pair of zeros to be close to this quantity delta. This means that the zeros must be very far apart. So this is exactly what we want. We are this is a tool to study zeros that are very far apart. And if we use this tool, we we'll also can obtain a formula for this in alpha is small and similarly to Montgomery, he conjectures the behavior when alpha is large. This is like a strong version of Montgomery's pair correlation conjecture. And using this tool, we were able to obtain a formula for the number value when the shift is much larger, zero log of log squared of two. And we can see that here for this second term, we need to use this function f delta apart from Montgomery's function f. So I think the takeaway here is that we really need to use this different tools to be able to obtain a formula that works uniformly for both small delta and big delta because we expect a different behavior in the two ranges. And as a consequence, if we are using this result, if we assume the recent hypothesis and chance version of the pair correlation for a delta, then there is conjecture hold in, in both branches for all delta up to this side. So what's interesting here is that for the first time, we can cover the two branches, the universal and the non-universal so part A and part B of the conjecture of variance. So now we'll talk a little bit about integers represented by quadratic forms. So here we'll start with this classical result of Fermat. We know that a prime can be written as a sum of two squares if and only if it is covered in one mod four. And actually, Fermat proves several related results. For example, we can ask what happens if a prime is x squared plus two one squared. And it perhaps shows that this has a similar characterization. A prime has this form of an only if that is common to one or three plus eight. So something very similar, just a union of chromostatic or a union of pragmatic regressions. But there are other examples that are more subtle. For example, historically, this was one of the first ones. If a prime of the form x squared plus 27 y squared, then the characterization is that the prime must be common to one with three, and two must be a cubic residue must be. So now this is more interesting, and this cannot be written in the previous list. This was actually a conjecture of Keller, and it was later proving it was later proved by Gao using the theory of cubic reciprocity. And to show that we cannot just use arithmetic regressions with congress classes. We can compare this with this other expression, 4x squared plus 2xy plus 7y squared. It turns out that we can show that they represent the same integer plus m for any m, but they represent different primes. For example, 31. 31 is 27 plus 4, but it is not represented by the second one. And 37 is represented by the second one, but not by the first one. So this doesn't really need to go beyond the arithmetic regressions. And now it's known that this is some very deep results of flat field theory and complex multiplication. Given there is an algorithm such that given n n, we can characterize all the primes of this form. But the algorithm is a bit complicated to carry out in practice. So to answer some questions of this prime, we need to use different tools. So let's go back to the case of complex squared. We define this quantity R of n as the number of representations of n as a sum of two squares. So a classical problem of gas is to estimate the average size of this. This is this sum of R of n of integers up to s. So we are counting all of the number of representations of integers of size of most x as sum of two squares. And this is the same thing as we have here a circle. This is the radius square root of x, and we are counting all of that and count the pairs of integers inside of the circle. So we want to count all of the 
lattice point inside of the circle. This is going to be gauss set that is approximately equal to the area of the circle by x. And he gave us a narrow term we go of square root of x. This was later improved by the thing using some idea of volume to a DR term x to the one third. And it's been improved a little bit more over the years using tools such as exponential sum. But still something just slightly smaller than x to the one third. So we can start to generalize those ideas. And for that, we consider positive definite quadratic forms, which in this talk, there are going to be functions of this form. So they're going to be in two variables. A, B, and C are co-prime integers, and the discriminant is negative. So the discriminant is minus B, and B is a positive parameter. There is a notion of equivalence of quadratic form, and we say that two quadratic forms are properly equivalent if we can go from one to the other by a linear change of variables over the integer with determinant one. So this means that this transformation is invertible, so they must represent the same integers and they have the same discriminants. So that's why we consider them to be a table. And some graphical results say that the number of quadratic forms of a given discriminant modulo proper equivalence is finite. And this is what we call the class number H of minus one. And similarly as before, we can define this quantity Rf of n to be the number of representations of an integer n by the quadratic form f. Then that shows that he computed the average size of this quantity similar to that, we can call it the ellipse problem because now we are counting the number of integer points inside an ellipse. And then that would say that this is approximately the area of the ellipse plus an error term s to the one third. This has been studied a little bit more over the years. For example, Bloomberg and Van Bill in 2006 studied a synthetic for higher moments of this one. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about primes represented by quadratic forms. So, we define by f to be the number of primes up to f that are represented by a given form. And Sarah Bakepotan shows that when he proved the prime number here, and he also proved it for primes in arithmetic progressions and also for primes represented by quadratic forms. And it has this asymptote. It is what we would expect x over log x. But it, it is multiplied by this factor. And this basically means that primes are uniformly distributed among all the equivalent classes of quadratic forms of a given discriminant. And takes the one. So now I want to study a uh, a different variation of this ellipse problem of Landau. So we want to estimate. We are interested in studying. Given an integer L, we want to estimate the average number of representations, but only over integers that are multiples of L. This was first studied by Saman in T, and he gave this formula. It is similar to Landau's formula, but that would have a function G. That depends on L, it is a very explicit multiplicative function, and he gave a narrow term x to the one half. So, our first theorem in this work is we can think of this function g as the number of solutions to this congress mod L. Our first theorem here is that we, have, we estimate the same quantity with a, the mean group the error term to x to the one third. So this is similar to the work in Landau and the previous work in the Gauss circle problem. So in particular, we have like an explicit version of we recovered the explicit version of the Gauss result. And something interesting is that two of the problem then showed that the error term cannot be any smaller than x to the one fourth. And as a corollary, using some thief methods. We can use this to study 
primes in short intervals. So here we want to count the number of primes in the interval from x to x to the square root of x. So what we obtain is we have the order of plenitude that we expect, but we obtain a bound with this explicit constant 28. To obtain a good explicit constant here, we want to obtain a good error term above. So now, the other problem that we want to study here is the problem of studying gaps between primes. So we want to study what the largest possible distance between consecutive primes at some invariant equality. So Kramer shows that the distance between primes can be at both square root of pn log pn. And this is the best that we can do, even assuming the remedy hypothesis even should, even so the real answer should be much smaller. So for the past 90 years, the efforts have been in concentrated in making this constant p as small as possible. And there have been several results, and the best approach so far was introduced by Canelo and Lenovich and Thunder again using Fourier optimization to bring this constant to this nice fraction that is for the first time something less than one. And this was later extended to grants in arithmetic progression. So here we are interested in extending this to primes represented by quadratic forms, and this is our result. If we assume the general agreement hypothesis, then the distance between consecutive primes represented by a given form, it should have the same order of magnitude, square root of p dot p. We have an explicit constant 1.8 times the class number. So the first that we can say a little bit about the method of the proof. So there are two main ideas in this work. And the first main idea is that we have three equivalent languages. We have the language of positive definite for the form, the language of lattice of inner two, and the language of ideals of imaginary quadratic fields. And we can, in some cases, it is more convenient to work in one or the other language. And we use all three languages in this work. And the second main thing is the use of Fourier analysis in this way. So first, we shall obtain a summation formula that connects the objects that we want to study with an arbitrary function in its Fourier transform. And next, once we have this, we must choose an adequate step function that recovers the information that we are looking for in the best possible way. So now we go back to the ideas that I was talking about in the study. So, so let me show you a little bit how this looks like. So for the first result, we have this formula here. So this is a very good formula, but I think it's a nice formula because the important part is here on the left, we have exactly what we're looking for. We have a sum of our quantity Rx, which is what we want to understand in our first result here, and only over multiples of L like we want. And we have now an arbitrary function G, like in the second C. And here on the right, we have a Fourier transform. So the important part is that the formula connects what we want with the function and the Fourier transform. And starting from here, it's going to work. We can recover our result by choosing an appropriate function. And similarly, we have this other nice formula here. This is called the Guinan Bell Expected Formula for L functions. And again, it's a big formula, but the important part is that here on the left, we have a sum over the serial growth of the Hecke L functions. And we have an arbitrary function G. And here on the right, we have information on prime ideals. And here, this is the amount function of K. Uh, oh, you can find in this way here in the bottom. So it, it allows us to identify prime ideals. So this formula connects serial of an L function with prime ideals of a quadratic number field. And with, with an arbitrary function and it's fully transfer. So it connects everything that we are interested in. And starting from this formula and with a little bit of work following the strategy of Camilo and Novitz and the other if we choose the very special appropriate function that we find in the computer, then we can recover that last result. So the function that we choose looks like this. Mm -hmm. 
So you mentioned this is of the device extent this uh this range to prove the projector of Barry in this long range. You go up to log log the four turns, right? Log B to the four turns. Yes. So it's the main obstruction to go beyond that. You expect to have some variation of your methods to work a little bit. So if I understand correctly for the conjecture, it's something below a little over log T and bigger than log T, right? Yes. So then we hope to go beyond that. So part of the problem is that in, in this conjecture that's like transaction first with the pre-production conjecture, we already have this restriction and that is where it comes from in, in this color. Uh, so here we have little row of log squared of t. And so there are some obstructions in in the computation here to go beyond that, but we do expect it to be true in a much longer range, but it is not clear how to extend this. So if you had this chance conjecture in a longer range, we will obtain yes for, for this range. And what's the reason that the chain did not conjecture this in the longer range? Is it obviously false in the it is not objectively okay. false, but for chains for a uh, yes, but the other terms that depend on delta no longer work out. So it might be true in a longer range, but I don't know. We actually emailed Chan to ask him. Uh, <laughs> so what was the, the reason? So he thinks it should hold in a longer range, but there's one term in his paper he has no idea how to estimate, uh, which clearly like blows up at this point. Uh, so he didn't feel comfortable saying it holds in a longer range because there's some term in his paper that obviously gets fake. Now maybe it's canceled by something else that's been, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so he actually I don't, I don't remember, but we could probably take up the email. He said in the equation, you know, 43, yeah. this term is fake that he's yeah. <laughs> um, Uh, that thing in the end. Yes, yeah. yeah. I I don't know this this uh, 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 Yeah, I guess. Uh, so, we're going to 